Hi everybody, welcome to Trading Conversations. You are here, my friend, because you believe that profitable trading is one of the most efficient ways to attain financial freedom and can be achieved as long as you are willing to put in the hard work to develop your trading competency. Our goal with this show is to introduce you to the traders who have dug through the trenches and emerged at the other end. From the sharing of their trading stories, strategies, workflow and best practices, I hope to help you shorten your learning curve as you embark on your journey towards trading mastery. Today's guest is the CEO and co-founder of one of the fastest growing stock market platforms in the Philippines with over 360,000 users. He started his journey into the trading arena at a young age of 20 when he was still a student. After getting a taste of success in trading, he decided to accelerate his returns by borrowing money from investors to increase his trading capital. As such, he was able to reach his first million at the age of 21. Along the way, he also worked for Macquarie and Credit Suisse as a stockbroker. Having been trading for a living over the past eight years now while running his young trading platform startup at the same time, I'm sure he has plenty of stories to share with us today on what it takes to trade profitably while running a business at the same time. So please join me to welcome John Christian Bisna, the CEO and co-founder of Investagrams. Hey JC, thanks for joining me in this episode of Trading Conversations. I still remember the first time that I met you uh, over coffee when you were in Singapore for a business trip. And I was honestly pretty impressed that a young chap like you has already achieved so much being a profitable trader while at the same time running a hugely successful startup in the Philippines. I believe that you are already a highly regarded personality in the Philippines. Uh, but as many of our audiences are based in Singapore and elsewhere, most people might not really know who you are and how you started your trading journey. So I think for a start in this interview, uh, it would be great if you can uh, start off by chatting a little bit about your past, right, JC? So uh, can you share with us a little bit of yeah. how you started your journey and uh, what was it like to start dabbling in the financial markets at a young age of 20 years old? Yeah, so hi, Philip. Thank you for having me here. So during my... During when I was 20 years old, I was in college back then. I didn't really know much about finance or trading. But then I came upon this internship opportunity with Macquarie Securities. So when, 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 I, when I heard that it was about the stock market, actually the first time I heard about the stock market was in Will Smith's movie, The Pursuit of Happiness. So I remember the term, the stock market, it's the, the avenue where Will Smith was able to make himself rich and achieve financial freedom. So it struck me again that, hey, this Macquarie internship opportunity, maybe this is the key to getting inside the stock market. So I took the internship opportunity. I was an assistant of the dealers, the traders there, and monitoring the markets. At first, I didn't really know anything about the stock market. I just tried to cram the knowledge by reading 24 hours investing book. <laughs> so it tells you that you can learn investing in 24 hours. But then after that, I got a hang of it. After that three month internship stint, I saw that there were lots of opportunities in the market. It was just like a game where if you were able to capture the upswings and avoid the downswings, then you could replicate the, these trades and make enormous wealth. So that's really my first encounter. And then after my internship stint with Macquarie, I decided to start trading when I returned back to school. So that's the first step of my journey. And how old were you back then when you were on the internship? Oh, I think I was, I was 20. Yeah, I was 20 back then. Okay, so was that the uh, first time that you actually started really trading real money? Yeah, so, so after that internship, I took all my life savings. So it wasn't that big, around uh, 500 to 1,000 USD. And then I started trade open. I opened an online account and then started trading. But after two months, I realized that hey, if I wanted to make serious money in this endeavor, then I needed to increase my capital. So as a, as a young student, you don't have any avenue to raise your capital, right? So what I did was I looked for potential investors and I convinced them that 
hey, can I borrow your, your capital for one year? I'll pay you 1% a month or 12% per annum. And then that's how I initially built up my capital. Wow, wow. That was so you actually started trading for two months and you literally went out to borrow money from investors to start to trade. So yeah. why would the investors trust you in the first place considering that you didn't have any track records and how was your trading uh, performance and experience like during that just short two months? So I think my initial starting capital of 25,000 increased to around 20%. But then that was really nothing. So what, what I had to sell to the investors was, I came from Macquarie, I came from Credit Suisse, uh, not yet Credit Suisse, sorry. I came from Macquarie and I know how institutions operate. I'm studying and developing my own strategy. So please give me this chance. So it was a long process. My first investor was, we, we talked for about three hours before I was able to convince her, him. And then, and then what really, what I think what really convinced them was I just told them um, if I'm going to pay you no matter what. So that's a 12% for one annum. It's a fixed return. So if, if, even if I lose, let's say I lose 20, 30%, then I'm just going to go to work and I'm going to pay you everything back. So I covered the risk instantly. So I wasn't talking about the, the hype, the reward. I, I was telling them that if, we go on the worst case scenario, I can still pay you and I will do that. So I think that's how I was able to gain my first investor. I see. So you took on personal liability just to get your initial amount yeah. of capital in that sense. Okay. Okay. So share with, yeah. share with us a little bit more. How was the uh, trading experience for you, your trading journey for you after raising the funds uh, and, and how long did it take before you actually return the money back to your investors? Yeah. So, so first, I got 200,000 pesos. That's around uh, 4,000 USD. So that was my second month of trading. And then the 200,000, I was able to grow to around 250K. So I, I, I made 20%, I, I made 10 to 15% in less than two months. It was a bull market back then. This was in 2012. So everything was easy. Uh, I was studying a bit of technical analysis, investing in growth stocks. So things were going on my way. But on my fourth month as a trader, I was really, I'm, I'm the kind of person that's really aggressive. If I dedicate myself to something, uh, I really need to go hardcore in order to level up fast. So what I did in my fourth month of trading, I looked for another investor <laughs> and I, I, I took another 400,000 loan. So the total loan capital that I have was 600K or almost half a million pesos. So from that 600,000, things suddenly became different because all my gains in the 200 to 250K, that was just 10% of my new capital. So at first I was trading at a profit 600, I was able to make to 660, but then market time came, uh, summer time came, I remember I was exposed into some mining stocks and oil stocks, and then they have this connotation, sell in May and go away. I was in vacation and I was fully exposed. That was where I first felt my first 10% loss in a portfolio value. So from 660,000, I instantly went back to six, uh, 580. So all my gains were wiped out during that period. And then that's where I had to really do some studying. Like I needed to improve my strategy. I wanted to learn how to control risks better. And then from that point on, uh, I systematized my trading and that's where I recovered after that. I see. So before that drawdown came, you wasn't actually, you were really based on the, 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 the bullishness of the market that you actually made those money initially, right? And, and you, do you really actually already have some kind of risk management um, back then, or was it that, that drawdown that causes you to start thinking about, oh, shit, I better start learning how to manage my risk from there? Oh, uh, what's good was the one reason why I'm, I'm extremely confident in scaling up the capital was uh, one of the first books I studied was William O'Neill's book, uh, How to Make Money in Stocks. And so he iterated there the, the simple rule of cutting your losses when you have 7% or 8% drawdown and then 
holding around five to eight stocks. So never go all in. So even with these, excuse me, even with these simple risk parameters, I was able to protect myself in a way. So from the starting point, 25,000 up to my first million, I was already trading in a balanced manner. I guess when I first encountered my drawdown, that's where I realized that, hey, this is some serious business. You can't just play, you can't just go around here playing, playing it like a video game. So I, I think besides the risk management, what I learned more was having a specific selling system that when, when, when warning signs come up or when markets go to exhaustion levels or resistance levels, you need to be able to tranche down or minimize your exposures. So that's the big lesson that I learned during that point in time. I see, I see. So um, how did it work out for you thereafter, after that draw now, after you came back from your holiday, what was it that you did differently thereafter that um, propelled you towards uh, a, even a stronger path in terms of your trading journey? Well, actually I was still quite an amateur back then. The first thing I did was cut all my losses. So all the positions that showed eight, eight, 10 percent downsides, I trimmed them down instantly. So I was mainly in cash around 100% or 90% in cash. So I was trying to observe the market first. Of course, after being hit by a strong blow, you need to recover and balance yourself. And then there was this uh, quite notorious stock in the Philippines that IPO back in 2012 or 13, around 12, 2012, if I remember right. This is the, the stock called Kalata or Cal, C-A-L. So during, Kalata was the story of an agricultural company headed by the youngest billionaire in the Philippines. He was 31 years old. So he transformed their mom and pop business into a modern agricultural company. So what, what was, if you search Kalata, you, you're going to see that, oh, this guy seems different. There's something, there's something about him like spiky hair, cool clothes and like that. And then during that time, uh, I researched on his background and it came upon that we were in the same, we came from the same alma mater, same university. So De La Salle University. So it was really just gut feel that in my, in my gut, I was thinking this guy is going to make something out of his stock. This is just, this is, this won't be a normal stock. There's going to be some magic here. So, so it was funny after hitting that, more than 10% loss, the, the, the next big trade that I did was Kalata. Just because the, the, the stock IPO'd at around seven pesos something, seven, and then I wasn't able to buy at first. So it went nine pesos, it, it went 11, then it went, went around 12 to 13. So it was trading in a chart like a, lad, like a staircase. So I wouldn't say that it's really like fabricated or there were good operators on that stock. Mm -hmm. So in my mind, the, that staircase, I knew that I had to ride onto this stock. So it's very funny. I was in the toilet. I was sitting on the toilet when I decided, okay, okay, uh, I'll buy into this. Let's take a chance. So I, I put around from that 580,000, I put around... 380 to 400,000. So almost 70 to 80% of my portfolio I put into Kalata. But of course, I had my stops in place. So what William O'Neill told me, if the stock goes 8%, then cut loss. So, so I took that into my mind. And then I bought at around 12 or 13. And then every day it went into that staircase movement, like 15, then 17. Then it went as high as 19, 22. Then I'll tell you about how I sold. Uh, after a few weeks or five, uh, one week, it went from 13 to 23, 22.95. But the problem was during that day, my internet, you know, internet in the Philippines, it's really not too good. My internet started to crash. And back then we didn't have strong connections in the cell phone. So I was supposed to sell at 23, but then... The, the internet didn't connect. From 23, I already had 200,000 pesos in profit. So that was my first time making, as a college kid, that was the first significant money that I made. 
Then from 23, it went crashing down to 20, 17, 18. Then I think as low as 14 or something in, in one day. In one but single then, day. Yeah, one single day. So that was like the bubble pop. But then um, I was supposed to sell already because my cost was 13. I was, I was supposed to sell at 15 just to take. So from 200K, I only had 20K gains left. So I, I lost my hope. I was really pissed. I was supposed to press the sell button. But good thing the platform asked me, are you sure you want to sell? Like the confirmation. <laughs> but because the internet was so slow, <laughs> I wasn't, the, the, the page started to load. And then I saw the ticker. People were starting to support Kalata again at 15 pesos. Like the, the stock jockeys was starting to buy at the support level of 15. So this, this broker, I wouldn't, I, I'm not going to name it, but the, the operator was starting to buy at 15. So I decided, Hey, I won't sell. I won't sell. Let, let's hold first. And then after one or two days from 15, it went 17 then back to 24. That's where I was able to sell everything. So it's like a second chance. <laughs> if you look at the chart, it happened in one to three days crashing and then going back and then it made a divergence or double top. And then that's the end of it. I was able to, luckily I was able to sell at that second chance. So that's how I, I was able to grow my portfolio from around 600,000. It jumped to around 900, 800 plus or 900 plus. So that was my first kicks, my first boost when I was starting. Yeah. I I see. And, and was that basically the, what was basically the main strategy you were using throughout that entire period? Is it like um, I identify one stock and just whack it with a stop loss and then see if it works out. If not, then you just look for something else. Is that generally the, 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 the strategy you are looking at? You were looking at at that point in time? Uh, admittedly, uh, I wasn't, I didn't have any solid technical system or strategy back then. So I think I was mainly relying on analyzing the, the staircase charts, the price action, and then the ticker. So it's mainly the it's mainly how the it's mainly on the bid and ask, the quotation and the ticker that I was relying during that time. I was totally a, a beginner back then. So that was a very risky move. But then I was really lucky that I came out with a profit because a lot of my friends lost money during that time. So some of my friends, they bought at 18, then, then they just held 13, nine, seven. And then you know what happened to the stock today? The stock went as low as five, then three, then two, then now it's delisted. Oh, <laughs> yeah, oh my so God. And I believe that a lot of the investors or traders who doesn't really know what they are doing, don't have stop loss, probably will be holding it all the way until yeah. it's listed, right? Yeah, that, that's the sad part. If they don't have the stop loss or they just believe on the long-term potential, the long-term story without any risk management, then a lot of people really got, got stunned. So just to continue on your question, uh, I was a total amateur beginner back then, but then since I made my first jackpot, so as a college student, making around uh, 8,000 USD or 300,000 pesos, that's really a lot. That's almost one year or two year salary. So in my mind, yes, I was happy, but my attitude was, I have to be able to replicate this thing. I can't just rely on lucky all-ins or lucky circumstances of stocks that are operated well. I need to be able to rinse and repeat this thing so that I can make a living out of the markets. So that's the good thing about what I did. Instead of being complacent, I studied harder. So I, I bought more trading books. I spent more practice, more time practicing. Yeah. And uh, how, how, at what point do you start to realize or think that you have reached a certain stage where you are having a more systematic approach towards your entire trading uh, business and not just simply depending on luck, but you really know how to manage your risk. You know how to actually size your trades. When did that actually happen? So I think it's a gradual process. So after that lucky trade, I, I made a few consistent trades and I was able to break out of the 1 million mark. 
But when when my portfolio 2013 was one million, that emerging markets were crashing. So I'm not sure if Singapore was affected too. But but during that time, I think that's the first sign where they were starting to hike interest rates, if you can recall correctly. So 2013 markets back then were crashing five percent to seven percent a day. That was the index not just specific stocks. So at that point in time, I, I thought that, wow, biggest crash in one day, according to the news. So what I did was I went all in, I bought several blue chips, <laughs> but then <laughs> I thought it was the bottom. The next day, the market gapped down again with another five or 6% drop. And from all my holdings, I was fully exposed. That's, I was able to feel another 10% loss. So it was, I was diversified, but regardless, the market was correlated. So I took another, another major loss during my, my, my first year. So that's my first six digit loss. So from one M plus, I lost 10%, 100K plus. So, but again, I just followed William O'Neill's rule. If your position or your portfolio is showing you 8% or above loss, just go cash and study again and find the next setup. So I followed that. And speaking of consistency, I was able to really develop myself. After you, you feel the pain, right? It's, there's two things that can happen when you, fear, when you feel the losses. It's either you quit, you do revenge trading without any sort of improvement, or you use that pain to actually develop your new framework, your new system. So during this time frame, when I went cash, uh, I looked for books that could help me in my problem. Like how do I handle six digit losses? Because if I wanted to trade a bigger amount, then I needed to control my psychology and my system. So I came up on this book called uh, Trading in the Zone. So I'm not sure if you've read this by Mike, Michael Douglas. Douglas, oh, yeah, yes, yeah, yeah. I think it's one of the best like trading psychology or systems thinking books out there. So I read that book and I didn't trade for around two to three weeks. So I, I really grasp his message there, where before you even put a trade, you should already calculate the risks. You should already understand that the market will do anything. It can go up, it can go down. The most important thing is what are you going to do about it? How are you going to prepare when you actually put that trade? So I think that helped me a lot in my development. And to finally answer your question, I just continued trading for the next two, two to three years. Then on my third year, that was where I was able to say that, hey, I can do this consistently enough. Like the regular swings, whether it's a profit or or a loss didn't affect me anymore. I was just operating based on my system, my framework. So doing that consistently, I was able to multiply my portfolio by a certain degree. And that's where I said that, whoa, I've gotten the hang of it. I wasn't complacent. I didn't think that I was an expert, but I was already comfortable in finding new trades, making bigger positions, cutting my losses when needed. So that's where I was able to say I, I became consistent in my third year. And uh, how long ago was that compared to now? Oh, this was 2015, 2015. I see, I see. So that's about four years, uh, four years back. Uh, yeah. You started to uh, reach that stage where you think that you are generally really proficient, uh, not just not yeah. just lucky profitable but actually proficient as well yeah. so did yeah. uh, anything change yep. for you thereafter the the uh, since four years ago do you like make any more significant changes to your trading workflow trading strategy or your your trading psychology in any aspects of those or do you just con constantly just apply the same uh, basic methodology throughout since then hmm. well it, it's it's definitely a constant improvement but what's good, so I just continued reading um, books about other market wizards like Jack Schwager's book. So I, I, I tried to study what other good traders are doing. And what's funny is that a lot of them would have the same, the same main framework. So the, the, the framework that really st stuck to me was 
you should hold your winners, ride, ride the winners or the market favorites, cut your losses short. So if, the, if a stock is acting weak or it's dragging your portfolio, you should have a smaller allocation and then risk management. So those three simple rules, allocating on strong stocks or trending stocks, cutting losers or avoiding downtrend stocks, and then, and then balancing your portfolio so that no single trade can destroy you. I think those are the three main components that I just practiced throughout the years. And of course, uh, the, the, the main framework is the same, but what you actually develop over the years are the small details, perhaps minor adjustments on where you buy or sell, or example, there are many times before where I wanted to ride super stocks, like stocks that go 100%, 200%, but, but I observed that a lot of times I was selling early. So there were super bagger stocks that I, I've been, I had the perfect buy price. I, I bought them early, but I'd sell them at 20%, 40%. I thought it was good already, but I didn't realize that, hey, you don't know the upside. Strong stocks can really go on a strong trend. So that's where in my latter years, I was able to grasp that framework that the upside, you have to respect it. Sometimes you can't give a target price or a fixed notion that this is high already because the real strong stocks will just continue to go up. So I think that's the discipline. So, so it's not just about the discipline of managing your losses. It's about the discipline of not taking profit instantly if you're in the right position. I see, I see. All right, so uh, Jesse, before we move on to, uh, for you to share a bit more about your current uh, trading strategies workflow in general, yeah. uh, would you uh, just like to share with the audiences what might be some of those worst mistakes that you could remember during the early part of your trading journey when you were still trying to build yourself to become proficient? What were some of the worst mistakes that you made that you think will be very helpful for uh, our audiences to learn and, and, and know and prevent themselves from making the similar mistakes? Uh, so, the first mistake, uh, I think, though, though I learned this early, I think first mistake that a lot of beginners uh, incur is they, don't, they enter the market without a system, a strategy. So that's the first mistake. Because if you don't have a specific set of rules or parameters to determine where you're going to buy or sell, then every trade that you make can potentially be a mistake. So these are the, these, this is common to most beginner traders that enter the market based on rumors, tips, gut feel, their friends, their emotions, or just some random purchasing of stocks. So that's the first mistake. Uh, you need, as early as possible, you need to be able to determine a system or strategy that can be repeated so that you can make money over time. And then, Next mistake that I think is important. As a beginner, if you're holding, of course, when we're starting, we're not really managing that, that big of a portfolio. So may, maybe most beginners would start with a, an account less than 1,000 USD or 50,000 pesos. And if you're holding a portfolio that's not so big, in your mind, you're getting complacent because in your mind, oh, it's okay, I can go all in on this. It's just a small amount. And if I lose this amount, I can just work for it. My salary is going to cover this up. But, but I'd like to point out that even if you're starting with small amounts like 1,000 USD or 2,000 USD, it's good to be able to practice a balanced trading approach already like risk management, making sure that you know your position sizing and the probabilities of the, the trades that you're making. Because what you develop at the early stage you also bring at the latter stage. So I think that's, that's one barrier that I see that hinders a lot of traders to progress. I see lots of traders, they are good on 100,000 to 500,000 accounts, but when they progress to 1 million, 3 million, 5 million, then they bring these bad habits of acting like superstar traders, going all in carelessly. That's where it becomes painful when they 
encounter mistakes at that higher level. So I think that's, that's an important thing to take note of. Fantastic, fantastic. All right, so uh, now before I move on to my question, some, uh, some of the other questions to ask you about your current trading workflow and, and, and strategies, uh, Jesse, I understand that you are actually currently organizing this wonderful event in Singapore on the 27th of July called the Investograms Traders Summit, where you actually invited traders, fund managers, and market wizards from around the world together to exchange trading experiences. Would you like to share with us a little bit more about this event and who will be speaking? in this event other than yourself? Yeah, so we, we're launching Investagram Trader Summit on July 27th in Singapore, Joyden Hall. So what we did here was in order to level up the retail trader strategies, we want to learn from some of the best and most notable traders in the world. So what we gathered when, when I was starting as a trader, I didn't have any formal mentors. So what we actually did was the people that you could, you could have only read about in books, we tried to bring them together live in, the, in, an, in one event so that they can share to you their trading knowledge firsthand. So we've invited certain market wizards such as Mr. Mark Ritchie. He's featured as one of the first market wizards in Jack Schwager's book. And what's cool is his son is also trading, Mark Ritchie II. He's featured in the Momentum Master, Master's book of Mark Minervini. So Mark Ritchie II. So it's a father and son combo. It's good. It's really fortunate that these speakers, they came from United States, far, far away from Asia. They're willing to go here and share their insights. And then another, another person that we invited was Andreas Plenau. So he's an author of two books, Trend Following and Stocks on the Move. So these titles may seem common, but Andreas' specialty, he's the CIO, Chief Investment Officer of the hedge fund called Assis Capital in Switzerland. And if you take a look at their background, based on their portfolio performance, they never had a major drawdown throughout their years. So if you can see their returns, it's just going up and up. And the first time I, I first noticed of Andreas was when I was researching on quantitative trading. So Andreas will share how he use quantitative trading to get an edge in the markets. So I think that's, these are the newer form of strategies, more modern strategies that, that we, we, we don't often get, get exposure to as regular traders. And lastly, of course, we're bringing in some of the great local traders in Singapore, such as Robin Ho. So one of, Robin Ho, one of the most famous and known traders he was able to capture the major crash. Uh, he was able to short the market during the financial crisis and make 2 million USD. And then Mr. Jake Chow from CIMB, CGS CIMB, the co-chair and head of this, this chartered market technician group in Singapore. And lastly, uh, Rainer Teo, uh, our friend, so Rainer Teo has definitely saved lots of traders from destruction. And it's an interesting speaker lineup that we have and we're hoping that we could see you there. Wow, sounds great. Sounds fantastic, man. I can't wait for the conference to come soon enough. All right, so for yeah. those of you who are watching into this interview video that I'm conducting with uh, JC Bisna right now, if you're interested to find out more information about this trading conference, uh, please pay a visit to traderwave.com slash JC Bishna. I'm personally attending this conference to learn and interact with the highly accomplished traders. So you might want to consider joining me as well. All right, so Jesse, let's go back to uh, your current yeah. trading workflow strategies. I think the audience will be really, really keen to know how do you actually manage a really successful startup while at the same time still trading profitably. So could you share, share some, some light about your trading workflow? How do you go about managing such um, 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 busy schedules to be able to do both at the same time. Are you predominantly like a, a, a long-term kind of position trader, swing trader, or are you even uh, looking like doing intraday trading at this moment in time right now? So, so one thing that I've learned, one of the first books that, uh, that really made an impact to me was Jesse Livermore's story. The, the operate, uh, what's that again? The, the reminiscences of a stock market operator. So during that point in time, a lot of 
Jesse Livermore's mistakes when, was when he tried to overtrade, right? So I'm sure a lot, all of us can relate to this. When, when you try to force the market, it's going to slap you if you don't deserve the right, if it's not the right opportunity, it's going to slap you with losses. So what I realized was instead of making too much mistakes, I tried to create a system where I wouldn't trade frequently. So I would only trade the bigger moves or the bigger picture, major moves. So that's one reason why I'm able to balance my busy schedule and still find stocks that are going high. So it's mainly, if you would describe my strategy, it's a mix of position trading and a mix of trend following. So that, that's my core, core framework. So I don't focus too much on the micro moves like 2%, 7% gains. 7% is okay. But as much as possible, what I'm trying to find are the, the big moves that can really impact your portfolio year on year without you having to monitor the markets consistently. So speaking of workflows, uh, we have this tool uh, called the Investor Screener. So it's basically a screener where you can save your parameters and every day the screener will just text you and alert you which stocks are inside your parameters. So this is one tool that I utilize. So when I was a kid back then, when I was starting, we didn't have screeners. You just have to you had to go through the charts one by one and or just randomly pick a stock in the ticker. But w once I was able to systematize my strategy, then I can just rely on a screener. With just one click, I could instantly rank and filter, oh, these are the strong stocks. So now it's just a matter of looking at the charts. Where can I buy here? What's the breakout point or what's the support level? And then that's how I do. And another thing, if you're a really busy individual, then you have to put your, your execution in a bigger time frame. meaning my stops aren't that tight. So, so now that I'm managing a bigger capital, sometimes I would buy into a stocks in, in one stock, but I would tranche it down to more than four or five tranches. So what, the, what that means is I, 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 I scatter my execution into different levels that, so that if the stock didn't go high or didn't go to my expectation, then I could just easily cut loss with just small damage on my port. But if the stock went on a breakout or continued in a trend, then that's where I can scale in. So I think those are the, 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 the not so, not so, I think it, it, it doesn't sound so glamorous part. It doesn't sound so glamorous, like scaling in, scaling out of your trade, managing your positions, knowing when to triple, triple up on your positions. So I think that's one of the, the core, core improvements that I made over the years. I see. And that is also based on the fact that you should have a substantial enough capital base, right? Otherwise, you will be incurring. I, I, I'm not sure whether in Philippines, there's such a thing like uh, minimum commissions. Uh, but in Singapore, yeah, yeah, yeah. There's, there's this minimum commission that if you do not exceed uh, a certain beyond a certain size of trade, you have to be slapped with a minimum uh, dollar value in commission. So if you try to scale yeah. in with a small capital base on that basis, you will incur a lot of commission, a huge percentage yeah. of your entire capital just to do that. Right. So yeah. I suppose that would mean that you have to have a substantial uh, capital base in order to do that. So would you be able to share a little bit more on like um, on a day to day basis? How is your trading workflow like? So you mentioned that you actually use the screener to screen. Do you like do that every single day mm -hmm. or like? Do you do that like once a week, then you plan for your trade over the weekend and then you just execute accordingly during the week itself? How, how is it like roughly? Oh, so, so mainly I, I already do my screening the night before. So before sleeping or just after office hours, I would already screen which stocks can, can have the potential for the next day. So when trading day comes, I already know if a stock is trading at 397 if it goes at 410 then that means it's a breakout and i need to do something about that breakout so so what i do is i pre i prepare the night before and then i execute on the market so when it happens when when the price when the price move, moves to my favor whether it goes up or my my stop losses are hit so that's just how i react but 
one thing that I, I do, it's a mix of execution intraday, but I also do the add-on. Since I mentioned I was scaling, I, I do tranches. So one idea is I execute one tranche in the morning or whenever the signals are hit, whenever in lunchtime morning or wherever, when the price moves, and then I execute another tranche when there is confirmation in the latter part of the day or during end of day. So that's how I balance my day-to-day -day workflow. I see. So your trenches actually happen within the day itself, right? Only for, because you said, you mentioned that you're generally a, a position trader, which means that I would suppose yeah. you usually hold your prof. How, how long, how often, I mean, how long typically do you hold your profitable trades generally? I mean, assuming if they work out according to, to uh -huh. what you're looking at. So, so that's something that I, ha I have to develop, I think. So I haven't looked that much on time stops, like putting a time limit on my position. So what, what I really do now is more of system-based selling or buying. So if the stock is still intact and it continues to, to go in a trend, then I will hold on to it as long as I can. So one example was I've been holding this certain stock at around well, five months to six months already. So sometimes as long as the, the, the structure is intact and I still feel that it's going to make a bigger move in the future, then I'm just going to hold on to that stock. So, so it really depends. But for normal trades, for stocks that don't go on a big move, uh, it can go as fast as two weeks on speculative stocks or around two months for stocks that really go on a, on a short-term trend. I see. And uh, what is your typical stop loss strategy like, your methodology for your stop loss? So stop loss, it's either when, if, if I'm on a profitable position, then I just continue to trail my stops, use basic moving averages, plus a combination of price action. So if the price breaks down, moving at shorter moving averages doesn't sustain, then I trim my position. But it also depends on the, the, the DNA of a stock. So sometimes a stock, uh, some stocks don't go trending. They, they just go, they just spike and then die. So mm -hmm. stocks that, that are a bit more risky or a bit more speculative in flavor, uh, that these kind of names, speculative stocks, uh, I try to swing trade as well. So I look for divergences. So if there are divergences or major divergences that form on extreme moves, then I, I try to trim my position so that I can protect profits or even buy back when the stock goes to initial supports. So it's mainly indicator based and then price action based. So these are, these are how I formulate my stocks. I see. How do you go about like sizing the trade? Is there any methodology that you use? And at any point in time, do you have like more than a certain number of positions open at the same time? Or do you actually control that or refrain from having too many open positions at the same time? Well, when, when I'm able to identify the real winners in the market, like the real solid stocks, then I can go heavy. Like, like I typically go three to four stocks dividing my portfolio. So each stock would, would, would have 25% to 30, 30, plus or 40% exposure. 40% that's, that's, uh, that's only a few times. So it's, it's mainly 20 to 33% exposure. And that would be heavy already if, if you're trading a significant capital. So one thing that there are two ways that I, I could, there are two inform, there are two aspects that I consider when position sizing. First is the liquidity of the stock. Example, if you buy 3 million pesos of a speculative stock, how sure am I that I can exit when I need to exit? So I, I always observe the, the average volume, the, the, the bid and ask of this stock, and can I sell down when I need to sell down? So that's one thing. And then next, of course, would be the, the VAR, value at risk, or just the, making sure that even if this position loses, it's not gonna hurt too much. So I make, I, I'm making sure that on each position, the most damage that would happen to my port can go ranging from a 1% bar or if I'm confident or if I'm holding profits, it can go as high as 3% bar. But I, that, th but I only do the 3% the and above bar if I'm already on a profit. So that's how I can scale. So I use my initial profits 
to multiply my position, make it bigger. I see, yeah. I see. So you actually do decide on the each position's uh, value at risk and uh, you probably use that to size your trade so that to make sure that yeah. the, the value at risk is contained within that certain parameter, right? Yeah. I see, I see. All right, so cool. So, and uh, how do you go about taking your profits? Do you generally set a profit target or as you mentioned earlier on, you seem to be using some kind of a trailing stop. Is that, do you actually use a combination or do you exclusively just use trailing stop itself? So my, my, my main framework is I adapt depending on the market environment and then the stock that I'm trading. So, excuse me. So if the stock is a bit speculative in nature or a battered stock, example, we're trading a downtrending stock that, that's, that, that looks like it's gonna bounce. My tendency on that is I'm more inclined to sell on spike, sell on strength. So that's where I use my, my target prices or sell on, on the first spike or something like that. So that's where I become more conservative. But again, the other side of me is I'm a trend follower. So I, I mix both worlds. So one tranche, I sell when there's uh, initial TPs being hit. But the other tranche, if I feel like the stock still has a catalyst or a potential reversal story or any, any, any form of health that can sustain the move, then I'm going to leave a position so that I could trail my profits or either do another buyback if the stock continues on its move. So it's really a mix of setting target prices or following the trend. So depending on the environment, depending on the stock that I, I buy. I see, I see. Wow, wow, wow. Okay, so, um, so if that's the case, then that means, wouldn't that means that you would all constantly have to be manually observing how the positions are doing? Do you have, do you use any kind of like a systematic uh, uh, auto ent entry and exit kind of um, tools in order to help you manage those positions? Oh, right, right now in the Philippines, we don't have automated orders yet. So you can't use, uh, you can't use an automated system to execute for you. So what I do is just, I just monitor the market every closing period or when I have free time during the day, or when I see that, when I do my review at, at, at night, if I see that a stock is already entering a critical level or showing some exhaustion signs, then I need to monitor the next day. That's where I execute. So it's mainly manual for now, but if, if things evolve or if, if now, right now I'm, I wanna venture forth in the global market, so, so probably I can experiment on these more automated executions. Uh I see. So you, right now, you are mainly just focusing on the Philippines market. Am I right to say that? Or actually, have you actually looked at diversifying in other asset classes in other markets as well? Oh, uh, before uh, I used to trade uh, indices, Forex, and then I also shorted Bitcoin back then when I felt that it was on a bubble. But then the, uh, it's just for, for play. These, it's not really a serious amount of my portfolio because one, one thing that, one thing that, uh, one concern is if you put your money offshore, what will happen to the money? So, so I, I, back then I didn't take it seriously. It's more of just practice for me. But right now I actually opened an account in Singapore brokers. <laughs> so, so that's my next challenge to myself. I want to I wanna master the global markets. I see, I see. A great, fantastic. I think I will want to interview again, you again, as you start to explore the, the overseas. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, all right, cool. So, yeah, that's uh, another ball. All right, so Jesse, I understand that you being a trader, but somehow um, I think a, a few years back, you decided to start Investagram. All right, so um, I, I, I was actually thinking that if you might have want to consider like running, starting a hedge fund instead, since you already has, had the experience of raising uh, money when you were 20 years old. So why, why do you choose to start Investagram mm. rather than possibly like raising a fund and start, start, start your own hedge fund from there? Have you ever thought about doing that? Actually, actually, I did that. Uh, I'm a licensed stockbroker, right, in, in the Philippines. So, so I manage discretionary funds for clients. So it's like it's like a I pull, it's like a fund on its own, and then I do the decisions. I make I make a profit share from them depending on our agreements. So it's almost like a hedge fund. But during that time, uh, that was around 2000, 2013 to sixteen before Investagrams came. 
So what I realized was it's cool to make your own money through trading. But what we've seen in the Philippines was for the past 50 years, less than 1% of the population is investing into stocks or mutual funds. So for the, for the past 50 years, Filipinos didn't benefit from any economic growth or bull runs. While, while the fund managers, the, the clients that we had in Credit Suisse, Macquarie, was making tons of money investing into a growth market like Philippines. The sad fact was it, the regular Filipinos didn't benefit. So that's where I had the inspiration that, hey, whatever I'm making in the markets today, whatever million that I've reached, I just, I don't want to keep this to myself. I want to create a startup, a company where I can be able to share my passion and share it to other, my, my countrymen and to other Filipinos. So that's the reason why I didn't pursue straight into fund management because that, that's another path. If, if we only cared for money, then we're just going to raise 100 million pesos or trade it in abroad. Then every 10% of that, you're going to make 10M, 10M, 10M. Then if, if that's going to make you happy, then cool, you're going to be rich already. But the other side is I realized that I'm, I actually don't use my money just to share to you. Like the, the, the portfolio that I grew, the most expensive thing that I bought, I think, was a laptop, this laptop. So around, around 100,000 pesos. But I don't have a car. I don't know what to do with the money. So I, in my mind, I just want to utilize money so that you can create impact in the world. And that's why we chose to really focus on this startup. We, d we don't just want to be traders. We want to create a positive change in society. Wow, fantastic. That's really a, a noble cause. In fact, I can totally feel what you are feeling. Because personally for me, I really don't think that money matters a lot to me. I mean, it's good to have a certain amount of money, but beyond yeah. a certain amount, it really feels like, yeah. what else can I do in this world that can make me feel fulfilled and add value to other people's lives at the same that's, time? And I, and I suppose yeah. that's one of the main core drive of why you decided to start Investagram in the first place, right? I agree. Yeah. I see. I see. Okay. Can you share, share with us a little bit more of what, what does actually Investagram do and, and how can it actually help um, those um, retail traders or investors out there in their journey? Oh, so, so Investagrams is a website and app that helps you whatever level of trader or investor you are, you can find something that can help you succeed in the financial markets here in Investagrams. So we have learning modules, you can, you can practice virtual trading. We have analytics such as charts and screeners. And then we also have a social network community inside the platform. So it's like an all-in-one app except for the execution, the actual investing. So that's something that we're working on. So hopefully we can add that in the latter parts. Mainly what we're trying to do is since we're traders ourselves, we've experienced what it's like to start at level one, like starting from zero, finding capital, trying to raise money, and then sustaining yourself, being a consistent trader. So what we're trying to do is everything that you need to succeed, whether you're a beginner or professional, we want to put into one application. So that's Investagrams. I see, I see. So I, I suppose you started Investagram in the Philippines and, and I'm, I, yeah. I believe that you are actually in the midst of looking at expanding Investagram out of the Philippines. Uh, could you share mm -hmm. a bit more about your plans on how you plan to make Investagram really the, the, the main platform for most uh, retail traders and investors to use? What was your plan from here onwards? Oh yeah. So our plan is uh, the, the Investagrams that you see now is probably around 8%, 9% of our total vision. So we really want to add up on more features. And then we were developing more features continuously, more, more higher, high level tools that can help traders do their decision making. At the same time, we're onboarding more foreign markets. So before we started in the Philippines, but now we're, we already have Forex, SGX, and then later on, we're going to continue to add more markets. So that's really the co constant improvement as we try to re make a bigger impact, not just in the, our country, but in overseas markets as well. 
I see. Fantastic, fantastic. All right, so uh, it was a really great conversation with you today, JC. Um, and I, I would love to probably Hello. speak with you again uh, as you start to venture into Singapore and start to look at other different markets. Maybe sometime in the future, we will have a, have a chat again to look at how you have been progressed uh, on the front for both Investagram as well as for your own trading journey. So, uh, but before we end today's yeah. trading conversation, uh, I would like to remind uh, you again, the audience, if you are watching into this video right now, is that JC will actually be hosting and speaking at the Investagram's Traders Summit on the 27th July 2019. And if you are keen to learn from JC and other top traders on how to profit from the financial markets, remember to head to traderwave.com slash JC Bishna and find out how to participate in this trading conference. All right, so uh, that's it for now, my friends. And thank you, JC, for participating in uh, these trading conversations. Thank you so much, Philip. I'm your host, Philip Thiel, and I hope to have you joining us again in the next episode of Trading Conversations.